Well, hello and welcome to our very first Cowboy State Daily podcast. Welcome to The Roundup. But of course, The Roundup doesn't just mean gathering cattle at a ranch. This means a gathering of ideas, a gathering of topics and issues that are important to everyone here in the Cowboy State. And we are thrilled to have as our very first guest on The Roundup, Representative Harriet Hageman, who's actually a freshman in our U.S. Congress, but she is making her name known in Washington, D.C. We're grateful for that because Well, as you know, Harry, you're a small town girl. You know what it's like to come from a small place into a much more, a much larger arena. So, Harriet, first off, let me say thank you for joining us on our inaugural podcast. But number two, we'd sure like to know a little bit about you as a a small town Wyoming woman growing up on a ranch outside Fort Laramie. You know all about the issues that are important to rural Wyoming. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, first of all, I want to say how honored I am that I get to be a part of your inaugural podcast. Uh, This is very exciting for me. Cowboy State Daily is a part of every day for me. It's one of the first things I read when I get up in the morning so that I know what is going on in Wyoming. And it's not only the current events and the weather and the photographs, but also to uh, read the, the human interest stories. And I think that Cowboy State Daily is really doing a phenomenal job of, of, of describing what Wyoming is. Um, and so I encourage other people, I hope other people outside of Wyoming are, are paying attention to it because it does give a, a slice of, of Wyoming in our history. Yes, I grew up on a ranch outside of Fort Laramie. I still consider that area home. I live in Cheyenne with my husband, John. I have two granddaughters and I come from a very, very large family. In fact, my mother just turned 100 years old last Tuesday. And so over Thanksgiving, we celebrated her birthday with her. Uh, Our family is too large to really cook in a traditional kitchen anymore. So we had our dinner in the basement of the Methodist Church in Torrington. Had, I think, close to 60 people there with blended families and extended families. And um, I have 12 nieces and nephews. I have 20 great nieces and nephews. We've had six new babies this year. A lot of them were there. So I got to spend time enjoying all of the young ones. Um, And, you know, I I am very excited about where I come from and my background. I I grew up outside of Fort Laramie. I graduated from Lingo Fort Laramie High School, 30 some kids in my class, went to Casper College on a livestock judging scholarship. And then I went to the University of Wyoming where I received both my bachelor's degree in business and my law degree in 1989 was when I finally graduated from there. And I truly enjoyed my education, had some long, long, long standing friends from the university in Casper College. And I think that it really colors my entire view of the world, being from Wyoming and the kind of background that I had. I think that I'm so typical uh, for people who come from Wyoming. Uh, We have a a great amount of respect and love for our state. Uh, We stay very engaged in terms of our community activities. Uh, When you come from a small community, you have to do that. You are in, you're on the museum board and you're on the school board and you are in the legislature and you're a county commissioner and you're on the, uh, the local REA. And, and so I was just raised in a family where you participate and engage and deal with everything from weed and pest to uh, some of the, some of the more esoteric and more difficult issues on, on a national and international stage. So, you know, my background is why I am what I am. And, and that background is very Wyoming. Harriet, tell me about how you've brought that background to Washington, D.C. I mean, it's, it's a shark tank there, and, and you have to really take that background, that small town background, and bring it to this much larger arena. How do you draw on your background when you're dealing with these international and national issues? It's a larger background, but people are people no matter where they come from. And the way that you engage with people is those, I engage with people here the same way that I engage with them in Fort Laramie, Casper, Jackson, Sheridan, Evanston, doesn't matter where it is. You're honest, you're upfront. Um, I guess sometimes I'm probably considered fairly blunt. Uh, People have a pretty good idea of where I stand on things, but I'm able to explain what it is. And what what I think I've been able to bring back here is that a lot of people don't understand the West and they don't understand 
understand the challenges we face for a variety of reasons and what those challenges are. I guess I should I, I should be more specific in that. An example is 48% of our surface estate and 65% of our mineral estate is owned by the federal government. If you come from Georgia, you don't know what that necessarily means in terms of your tax base, your ability to develop, the challenges you have with housing and providing affordable housing, what you can do in terms of your community. So one of the things that I've been able to do is bring that voice back here and work with people from Georgia and South Carolina and Nebraska even, even though they're a neighboring state, they don't have the kind of federal footprint that we do. So that's one of the ways in which I've been able to bring that. But I think also it's a matter of common sense. And I will say that I learned um, when I've come back here, people were watching my race very closely, as you know, and because I, I was running against Liz Cheney. But I always said I was not running against Liz Cheney. I was running for Wyoming. And I have felt that since I have been here. My job is to represent Wyoming. I wasn't attempting to defeat any one person. I felt that I was the best person to come back here and have that voice for Wyoming. And because of my background, I think that I have been true to form in that regard. And I have been able to earn a reputation because of the way that I approach things such as the federal lands, such as uh, trying to protect our legacy industries, our oil and gas companies, uh, industries Industry, our, our coal industry, our livestock industry. Just today, the UN announced that they are going to pursue an agenda to try to reduce people's meat consumption because of this so-called climate crisis. We need to bring common sense back to the debate that we're having, and we need to bring truth to the discussion, which is something that's been sorely missing in this entire climate crisis discussion. Kevin Killow with uh, Cowboy State Daily, I think is one of the most brilliant writers and researchers on this particular topic. But the fact is, is that we we have to bring a voice of what it means to be one of the largest energy producers in the nation. What we do for people in Georgia, California, New York, Connecticut, how we make their lives better. And that's really the voice that I have tried to be. And I think that I've been successful at that because of my background. Harriet, let's talk specifically about some of these issues, in particular, the cattle industry. I know that you've been instrumental in trying to do some legislation, like, for example, the EID, the ear tag legislation that the USDA has proposed. You have actually proposed an amendment to basically stop what they're trying to do with the electronic ID tags. Tell us a little bit about that and, and of course, other cattle industry issues that you've been addressing there. So the USDA has been trying to do this for quite some time. And this is the way that the UN could actually implement a policy that is completely contrary to the freedoms and liberties that we're entitled to under our constitution. And I'm just gonna give you an example of what's going on in Ireland. In Ireland in 2022, they adopted an EID mandate, an electric, electronic identification mandate for cattle producers. Last month or in July of this year, they announced that they're going to have to call 41,000 head of cattle by the end of this year, not because of a disease outbreak, although that's the way that they sell this and say we have to have mandatory EID so that we then have disease traceability. But they're not killing 41,000, they're not slaughtering 41,000 head of cattle because of a disease outbreak. They're doing it because of the so-called climate crisis. They can't implement a mandate like that. They couldn't force those cattle producers to kill all their livestock unless they knew how many they had. And the only way they know how many they have is if they have an electronic identification uh, program in place. That's exactly what they're trying to do here. I've been fighting this for years, both as a private attorney, as well as, as in my role as a, a Wyoming's representative. And here's the thing, if people want to use electronic identification, more power to them, they have every right to do that. But this should not be a mandate from USDA. And that's one of the keys is I really do believe in freedom and liberty, and I believe in private property. So the EID mandate is something that it will be incredibly incredibly destructive to our cattle and bison industries. And it's why I'm fighting so hard against it and have a lot of groups in support of me, including a lot of Indian tribes who raise buffalo who do not want EID, an EID mandate. Another area where I have brought my expertise and my knowledge back here is dealing with the, the uh, Rock Springs RMP, the, the uh, resource management plan. As you all know, that was recently announced by the, the BLM and it, it affects 3.6 million acres in Southwest 
Western Wyoming. It's going to be absolutely devastating to our legacy industries, to our Trona industry. We're the largest Trona producer in the nation. If this goes through, we're going to not be able to compete with China and 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 uh, uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. I guess it's Kazakhstan is the other big one. Um, it's going to substantially affect our grazing industry, our cattle industry. It's going to affect our oil and gas and our coal industries. They It's going to affect our ability to recreate. They're trying to prevent us from even being able to take a bicycle out in the middle of nowhere in the red desert and ride a bicycle. I mean, this is draconian. This is, and it's well outside what the BLM was created for. It wasn't created to put millions upon millions of acres off limits to any kind of use and access. It was created to manage a resource at the time because those lands had not necessarily gone into private property, got into private hands yet uh, under the Taylor Grazing Act. But now because of Tracy Stone Manning, who is a radical environmentalist, this is the approach that the BLM is taking. So I've been pushing back very hard on that. Uh, in addition to which, under the under NEPA and under the, the Federal Land Management Policy Act, they were required to do a hard look at whatever alternative they were going to propose. Well, there's a retired gentleman from the BLM who has reported that they never did that hard look. They never analyzed alternative B, which is what they're attempting to implement now. So I did an amendment to strip them of any funding to be able to implement the alternatives that they've identified in that RMP. So those are some things that I think are very important for the state of Wyoming, for our cattle producers, for our industries, for our communities, pushing back against this federal overreach. Harry, where where does that amendment stand right now? Where is that bill in progress? So the RMP, right now, the RMP, they've extended the deadline uh, to January for comments. I actually believe that the BLM not only extended the deadline, they're regrouping and they're trying to figure out, okay, what do we do now? Because they will be sued if they adopt alternative B. And I do believe that they will lose in court if they adopt alternative B. And I think they know that too. So that's one thing. But as far as that was an amendment to the uh, Department of Interior appropriation, and we have passed that appropriation bill. So uh, the House of Rep- the, the Republican controlled House of Representatives, we've passed seven appropriation bills, seven standalone appropriations bills that we have sent over to the Senate. They haven't yet taken that up. But that particular amendment is included in the DOI appropriations portion of it. So I'm actually very excited about that. Um, We also, in terms of the EID, I'm trying to defund their ability to do that. What Congress has is the power of the purse. And so I'm using the power of the purse and saying, you cannot use any funds that we appropriate to implement something that, number one, you're not entitled to implement. Number two, is going to be devastating to our livestock industry. So those are uh, amendments that I continue to push forward with. And it may very well be that the EID bill is a standalone bill. I'm not letting that go because, again, I'm watching what happened in Ireland and another place where people can go look at what the outcome of this will be is if you ever watch the show Clarkson's Farm. Jeremy Clarkson is from England and he's the race car driver. He's the pretty interesting uh, guy. He's got a really funny sense of humor. Well, he bought a farm in England and this series, and it's a couple of seasons now, I probably shouldn't be promoting this, but it's really funny and it's fun to watch. Um, But he has to have essentially a full-time compliance officer work for him to comply with all of the regulations that the government in England poses against him. We're headed in that direction if we don't get control of this federal government and start pushing back against USDA and APHIS and these federal uh, agencies that want to regulate us out of existence. This is great stuff. This is very good for our listeners and our readers to know about where all this is going and, and the places that we can go to to see kind of what the potential future is in that way. Harriet, I'd like to go back to something that you mentioned about tribal relations and about the tribal lands and bison and grazing and things like that. Tell me about your work on the Tribal Affairs Committee, because we honestly, we don't hear a lot about that. Tell me how it is that you have managed to get a spot on that committee and and really what that means to you. Well, so I'm on the Natural Resources Committee. 
I'm on Judiciary, Natural Resources, and the Select Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. But on Natural Resources, I am on the Water, Wildlife, and Fisheries Subcommittee, and I am the chairman of the Subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs. So I oversee all 574 federally recognized tribes and our five territories, as well as uh, several island chains in the South Pacific, Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, with which we have special arrangement, arrangements uh, in, in terms of providing them with de defense and services and funding. And then we essentially can exclude China primarily from taking over the entire South Pacific Sea. So anyway, with my Indian work, it has been absolutely fascinating. I was extremely honored to be asked by Bruce Westerman. He's the chairman of Natural Resources. He asked me to chair that subcommittee. And I said, I'm a freshman. I don't know uh, what I can do. And he said, well, you can learn on the job. And I have. And I have been extremely honored to work with tribes across the United States and including in Wyoming, both Eastern Shoshone and, and the uh, Northern Arapaho. They've had their representatives back here testifying. I've had an opportunity to meet with them on everything from addressing the education issue and deficits, as well as Indian Health Services. So the two primary issues that I have uh, that I've been trying to address as chairman of that subcommittee is Indian Health Services. We need to do a much better job of providing Indian Health Services. I, we've had three hearings now with with folks who've come in from across the United States and testified about the challenges that they have in providing medical and dental care to our tribal members. So one of the bills that I'm working on and that I would like to move forward with is the only way we're going to be, I think one of the only ways we're going to be able to actually provide adequate health care and move in that direction to our tribal members uh, who rely on the federal government for Indian health services is if we can have uh, uh, doctor-owned hospitals. And as you may know, under Obamacare, they barred doctors from owning hospitals. But what that's done is that's really limited the ability for us to get dentists and, and, and medical providers on our reservations um, because they just don't have the incentive and it's, it, it's difficult to do that. So I'm working with our doctor's caucus and I have uh, submitted an amendment to one of the bills that they're moving forward with uh, so that we can have doctor-owned hospitals in rural areas, as well as on Indian reservations, because I think we need to do a much better job. There's a 10-year discrepancy in life expectancy between Native Americans and, and, and Caucasians, and that's wrong. That's, that's just that's just wrong. I, um, if you look at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, it's the poorest county in the entire United States. And again, I'm going to say it, that's wrong. Uh, we have to be doing things differently. I'm very passionate about this because I am horrified by some of the stories and things that I hear and the challenges that we have. Our, our education system, we've got to start doing better by the students that we have, our tribal members, our, our, our young tribal members. And then the other issue I've really focused on is trying to address some property issues. Um, try for An example is, is, is getting 40 acres for the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation so that they can put up a memorial for Wounded Knee. I mean, clearly what happened at Wounded Knee was a terrible situation. This gives them an opportunity to honor the people that were lost there and to make sure that that's not lost to history. Another thing that I've done is introduce a bill Right now, our tribes for their trust lands, they're only allowed to lease them for 25 years at a time unless they get special dispensation, <coughs> excuse me, from Congress. I want to increase that to 99 years because you're not going to get hard infrastructure on these reservations for a convenience store or a movie theater or whatever it might be if they can only lease for 25 years. So if they can lease up to 99 years, we can bring in more infrastructure to our reservations and hopefully do more economic development that way. So that's another one that, that I've been working on. Um, also, like for the Winnebago tribe, we're working to get land back from for them that was stolen by the Corps of Engineers many years ago on the Missouri River. Uh, we had a hearing with the Winnebago tribe. They came in and, and testified about that. So we're working to get a bill through so that those lands can go back to the Winnebago tribe where they belong. And there are just other things that we've done to try to get the trust lands where they need to be and to ensure that the that the uh, Native Americans, that our tribal members can, can determine their own autonomy. 
I mean, freedom and being able to determine their own destiny and being able to manage their own lands. All of those things are extremely important to our tribal leaders that I meet with. And I've just been working really hard to make sure that we can can, can uh, move down that road further. Well, it sounds like you are very passionate about that. That's fantastic. The scope of the things that you're able to touch and that you're able to to make a difference with. And this this actually brings me to a whole different idea. For a year now, you were elected a year ago. You've been in office there for 11 months now. What have you seen? How did your how did your impression of Washington, D.C. and the processes that go on there change from the time that you got there in January until now? So one of the things that I don't do is I don't I don't criticize Washington, D.C., and I don't refer to it as a swamp and I don't say things like that. Um, This is a beautiful, beautiful city. It's our nation's capital. There's so much history and architecture here and the museums and the opportunities to immerse yourself and learn about so many different things. The ability to go to the Library of Congress and just see how incredibly beautiful it is and, and what our forefathers did and what they created and why this is such a beautiful open city compared to other cities on the East Coast because nothing can be higher than the Washington Monument. There's just There's an awful lot to learn. Um, I think one of the challenges for me has been that when we identify a problem, I always say, how do we solve it? So I spend at least part of every day meeting with constituents, whether from Wyoming or from the oil and gas industry or the coal industry or tribes from Florida or gravel companies from California. I'm meeting with people every day and they come in and they talk to me about a problem. And I typically will say, how do you see we can go about solving that? What do you think that we can do? Uh, Do I need to write a letter? Is there a bill that we could run? Is there something that we need to change? Is there a regulation we need to address? Do I need to get a hold of it? An agency had, how do we solve this problem? I'm always trying to solve the problem. And I'll give you an example on the, the, the 99 year lease issue. Everybody pretty much agrees that that's what we should do. It just takes so much time to get those things done. And for me, that's that's a challenge. As an attorney for 30 plus years and a trial attorney, you get your case, you figure out the issues, you do your discovery, you go to trial or you settle the case, and then you move on to the next one. But you're always solving problems. You're always resolving something. And my frustration here is I see things that could be fixed. I know things that could be fixed and I we can't get them fixed fast enough. And I think that's where people get frustrated with Washington, D.C. and it's where I do. We have to find a way of recognizing recognizing that the status quo is not the answer. There are solutions. And for that, for the low hanging fruit, we ought to be able to move, move forward with those very, very quickly. But it's almost as though people kind of hold those things hostage to get something a little bit more difficult through. And I just don't believe in that mechanism of governing. I think we need to govern. That's wonderful feedback on that. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask, I mean, you are Wyoming's lone representative there in Washington, D.C., but you are part of a three-person team representing Wyoming. Tell me about how, how often do you connect with or consult with Cynthia Lemus and with John Barrasso? So in the spring, we did what was called Wyoming Wednesdays, and I would go over to the Senate office building, and when people would come in, organizations, groups, people would come in, they all knew to come there at 8 o'clock in the morning on Wednesdays, and we would have an opportunity to visit with them kind of en masse. We haven't done that more recently. I assume that we'll start that again next spring and do that for several months, a couple of months before we go into uh, more of the, I wouldn't say the campaign season as much as just uh, getting things wrapped up because we're getting towards the end of the 118th Congress. I spend some time with them, not as much time as I would have expected. For one thing, we have different schedules back here. We're not in session at the same time. Um, We also have different hearing schedules and different things that we're focusing on. I think another challenge is that the House is in Republican hands, the Senate is in Democrat hands. And so there's not an effort, even though we're putting bills through, and we've done a lot of bills, we've done a lot of bills. 
um, the Senate just doesn't take them up. So there just isn't that opportunity to go to sit down and try to find a way to reach a resolution with those. That's been another frustration that I have had. And there are some that are very bipartisan bills that you would think would get through pretty easily. One of the things that we did early, and, and I think the vast majority of the Democrats in the House voted for it, is to block President Biden from selling our strategic petroleum reserve oil to China. So he's been selling our SPR oil to China. We're now down over 60%. It's going to take over 10 years to refill our SPR oil and reserves. And, and the Democrats and Republicans in the House both said, we shouldn't be doing that. But we can't get the Senate to take up those kinds of things that I think are pretty common sense. So I don't spend as much time with John and Cynthia, but I will say this. They have been incredibly helpful to my staff. They've also been incredibly helpful for any kind of questions that I have. They've been good mentors of mine. We're just kind of on different, a little bit different tracks in terms of how we approach things. Very good. Let's really just very quickly, because we are getting close to running out of time here, but real quickly, one more major issue that we have kind of talked about, and you just mentioned the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but energy independence. You've addressed this in several pieces of legislation. Tell me a little bit about where you see it and how you can represent Wyoming's request for energy independence. Tell me about that. So I'm a, a member of the Coal Caucus. I obviously believe in energy independence. I'm going to use my mother as an example of why I think this is so critically important. Then I'm going to touch for a moment on the, the Middle East and what's going on with Israel. As I said, my mother turned 100 years old last Tuesday. And what I want the listeners to think about is what she has seen change in her life in the last 100 years. She grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota, and they'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to milk the cows, and then they'd go to work, and they'd you know work in the field and they'd have an enormous garden that they tended and they would chop the wood for the winter. They spent the vast majority of their time doing nothing but putting food on the table and making sure they had sufficient wood for the winter time. Um, their lives were very hard. And if you think about before my mother was born from 1923 prior to that time, you're talking hundreds if not thousands of years that the human condition was pretty static. It was pretty much the same for everybody and what I just described for my mother. In the last 100 years, because of the invention of the internal combustion engine and the ability to commercially develop oil and gas and coal, we have changed the world in ways that none of our predecessors ever could have possibly imagined. Air travel, our ability to go overseas, the prosperity that we have is related to one thing, and that's affordable energy. Our food, our, our ability to, to have the kind of food that we do and the access that we have is because of affordable energy. And we have an administration right now that is hell bent on making sure that we lose that. And I'm going to fight them every step of the way because I don't believe in government imposed wretchedness. This is critical. This is critically important to the future of our country and humanity. They, they, they can talk about climate crisis, but I'm going to tell you that the, the decrease in infant mortality rate because of the use of affordable energy and access to it, the increase in life expectancy because of the access to affordable energy, all of those things are light years ahead of what they could ever do in terms of keeping the earth from warming by one degree or whatever their metric is at this point. It is absurd to not look at the opportunity costs of what they're trying to do and their effort to destroy our energy and our food supply is is absolutely going to be devastating to humanity. Then let's go to the Middle East. What we're seeing and, and, and what we saw on October 7th, the barbarism associated with that, what we're seeing with uh, empowering a country like Iran, since they lifted the moratorium on Iran being able to sell oil, they have raised $80 billion selling oil. There was a moratorium. We were crushing their economy to stop them from engaging in and being a state sponsor of terrorism. And look where we are now. A weak United States makes for a very dangerous world at a United States that is not energy independent and not capable of exporting our energy resources makes for a very dangerous world. This is truly a matter of life and death. We have to protect our oil and gas industries. We have to protect our coal companies and industries. We have to be able to produce domestic energy and the entire world is better off for it when we do it. We are at the, the world is in is is blowing up 
And much of that comes back to failed energy policy. Wyoming is so important to that. We, we make people's lives better across this country and we can do it for the world as well. We have the resources, we have the, the, the companies, we have the trained workforce. We have so much in Wyoming. We have everything our country needs and I wanna make sure we can access and provide it so that the people of America benefit from that. Obviously, another topic that you're very passionate about. That's marvelous. And, and of course, it benefits us as Wyomingites. Harriet, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your time, for your work on behalf of the Cowboy State, and for your appearance here on Cowboy State Daily's very first episode of The Roundup. I'll say it again. I am so honored. Thank you. Well, we are as well. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas and all of those wonderful things. I hope you're going to get home for Christmas. I will. Yep, I'll be back home with my mother. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Harriet. And thank you, folks, for listening into our very first episode of The Roundup, Cowboy State Daily's podcast. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your listening. And we appreciate your feedback. So we'd ask, actually, for you to send us your ideas for podcast interviews. You can email me at wendy, W-E-N-D-Y, at cowboystatedaily.com. Or you can email news at cowboystatedaily.com daily.com. You can also go to our website and you can interact with us there. We'd sure love to hear your feedback. And of course, don't forget we've got our daily newsletter. It's completely free and brings everyone the most interesting stories that come from our wide, diverse, and beloved Cowboy State. Thank you so much for listening in. Thank you, Harriet, for being a part of our first podcast. Thank you. We'll be back next week, folks. Thanks so much. I'm your host of The Roundup, Wendy Core.